Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. I'm Megan O'Sullivan, the chair of the North America Group of the Trilateral Commission. I'm very pleased to see so many people joining us. I am here uh, in Houston, not in my beautiful virtual room, well, in my virtual room in Houston at Zero Week, which is the world's largest energy conference, where I expect we'll be talking about the, the opening of oil prices at $140. But I'm really pleased that we are able to bring together such an extraordinary group and such an extraordinary time. Um, this is a topic of concern to every member of the Trilateral Commission, and this is a crisis, as will be discussed, like none that we have seen for several decades. So again, I'm, I'm not going to introduce our members. I'm just going to thank them. Thank you all for joining us. Thank you all for um, your participation in whatever many of you may be doing in this crisis to try to ameliorate it. I'd like to actually begin before we turn to the topic of Russia and Ukraine and to Paula to introduce our guests. I'd like to simply um, mention that we have lost a very um, important and dear member of the American Trilateral Commission group over the last week, and that is Ken Newberstein. Many of you know Ken. He's a He was a member for a, a long time of the Trilateral Commission. He was the chief of staff to President Reagan, um, well known for being a, a confidant and being a trusted voice in both Republican and Democratic parties, um, went on to, to have several decades in Washington where he was a key player. He was, from our perspective, a member of our board and uh, the chair of the membership committee. So many of us on this call can uh, in some part uh, thank Ken for our affiliation with Trilateral today. I believe his, his uh, funeral is today and I know many of us will be thinking of him and we will certainly miss him. Paula, if I could turn it over to you and we'll get down to business. There's a lot of people here and a lot to discuss. All right, thank you, Megan. Welcome everyone. If I may also just say a word about Ken. Uh, I had the a a pleasure and privilege of working with Ken in the Reagan administration and a number of administrations. And I'll just say this, uh, not only was he a beautiful person, but he was a force to be reckoned with. And, you know, I think right to the end <laughs> of his life, he lived a full, rich and vibrant life. And we are certainly gonna miss him in a trilateral. Um, today, this morning, uh, afternoon, evening, depending on where you are, we really have a, uh, a dynamite uh, panel and we're going to have a really vibrant discussion. Uh, we have Fiona Hill, who I know all of you know, she was former senior director for Europe and Russia at the NSC and she's senior fellow at Brookings Institution. We're gonna hear from Carl Bildt, a former prime minister, foreign minister of Sweden, and also the co-chair of the European Council of Foreign Affairs. And then also we hope uh, that Dmitry Trenin is going to uh, connect in. We hope to see him. As you know, he's director of the Carnegie Moscow Center. Uh, without further ado, let me dive in. I wanna to go to you, Fiona, first. You've written a number of books about Putin and the question keeps coming up. Is this the same Putin or has he changed? I was very struck by Condoleezza Rice's uh, words about him uh, in an interview where she said he's erratic and, and she questioned whether he has descended into something not seen before. She even used the word, is this a de delusional, are we witnessing a delusional rendering of history? Uh, enlighten us. Well, thank you so much, Paula, and uh, good morning, good evening, and hello to everybody wherever you are at the moment. And I just want to first of all say that I do hope that Dimitri will be able to join us because things in Moscow are pretty tough as well. So I think we should all bear that in mind that, you know, that there's a, a massive clampdown going on in Moscow. This is not the fault of uh, ordinary Russians. This is very much a decision made by the person that we're going to be talking about um, in just a moment and a small clique of people around him. And it's going to be very difficult for all of our Russian colleagues at this uh, precise uh, time as well. Um, on Putin, uh, this question, of course, I'm thinking about it a great deal. And I do think uh, that there are some elements where he's become much more emotional and uh, more viscerally charged than um, he has uh, been in the past. But I would also like to posit that I think, you know, what we're looking at here in part is, you know, what we used to, um, you know, consider about Nixon, for example. Remember the whole Nixon madman theory that Kissinger and others used to talk about here, about there's some, you know, calculated unpredictability. 
the path that Putin has set himself on, he set himself on a very long time ago. And so there is actually a pattern of ruthlessness that we can already see extending back a considerably long period of time. He has had Russia, um, rather Ukraine, in his crosshairs since the early 2000s. Remember the cutting off of the gas of Ukraine in 2006. And people around him in the circle that has made this decision, again, in a um, narrow group of military and security people. If we go back, and Paula, you will clearly remember this, to the early 1990s, there was a lot of pressure being put by them and other nationalist Russian circles in the early 1990s on the whole premise that Ukraine even then shouldn't really be an independent country. Now, it is, of course, the case that it was Boris Yeltsin, along with the uh, presidents of Ukraine and Belarus at the time, that picked apart the Soviet Union in 1991. But the whole idea of Russians at that point was that Ukraine would stay close together with um, Russia, along with Belarus, in the Commonwealth of Independent States. And Ukraine was the, one of the first uh, former Soviet republics, uh, independent countries to pull away from that. And with those relationships unraveling, ever since then, there's been a lot of pressure on how to uh, push and pull Ukraine back into the fold again. And when Ukraine had the nuclear arsenal that it inherited from uh, the Soviet Union, along with Belarus, there were all kinds of assassinations, all kinds of statements coming out of Moscow from the Russian parliament, uh, Mayor Lushkov of Moscow, many other um, nationalist uh, circles uh, about uh, threatening Ukraine, talking about Ukraine going nuclear, what it already was because it had inherited the nuclear weapons. Sounds familiar, right? Because they're talking about that right now. Uh, people like Zyuganov, uh, the communist leader, have just has just come out you know, su suggesting that Georgia, Kazakhstan and Ukraine are uh, preparing with the United States some kind of biological weapons attack on Russia. All of that was happening in the early 1990s. Putin wasn't in power um, at that particular point, but he runs in those same circles of people who have uh, really been trying to figure out how to stop Ukraine from going off in some other direction, refranchising itself and becoming more European. And then, you know, when we look about the statements that Putin's made from 2006, 2007 onwards, we've all invoked uh, the um, the speech that he made at the Munich Security Con uh, Conference. Many of you were there. I was not, but I mean, I've played it over and over again to take a look. I mean, it was pretty emotional and pretty hard then uh, about his views about uh, the United States, the unipolar world and Europe and NATO. And from 2008 onwards, when Ukraine and Georgia got the open door offer uh, from the um, NATO at the Bucharest summit, I think the writing has been on the wall. Putin has made no secret whatsoever of his designs on Ukraine. It's just that it's been built up over time to this particular point. Now, I do want to stress again the ruthlessness of Vladimir Putin, which is something that I have written about. Now, I do think that, that something has changed, in fact, to harden his attitudes from the two years of COVID. I mean, we've seen somebody who's clearly paranoid about getting infected by COVID, the ridiculously long table. It's also, um, you know, for example, exacerbated that sense of isolation that he's clearly been in. People not being able to meet with him for two weeks uh, while they go into quarantine, you know, for even routine meetings, many members of the press and others have, you know, talked about this that I've, I've spoken to when they've gone to uh, do interviews. And he's clearly stewed in his own juices of all the things that he's been thinking about, about Ukraine and the rest of the region for some considerable time. But let's bear in mind of all the things that Putin has presided over as somebody who was an operative from the intelligence services. Poisoning of Alexander Litvinenko with polonium. We're pretty sure that he gave uh, the go ahead for that. You know, so basically a cruel and unusual punishment that turned Alexander Litvinenko into the first dirty bomb as a human being walking around London. The use of um, a highly classified, uh, uh, totally banned, we thought that it had all been destroyed um, stock of, uh, of weapons grade nerve agents of Novichok, perhaps three times, but certainly twice against Sergei Skripal and his daughter Yulia, and then um, against Alexei Navalny. Not to mention then all the clamping down and uh, repression of all opposition and dissent now, which we've seen coming to its uh, climax in Russia around, you know, basically the assassination attempt and then the repression of Alexei Navalny and his network. Intervention and invasion of Georgia in 2008, uh, which stopped short, uh, albeit of um, Tbilisi, but was certainly intended uh, to send a massive message. Before all of that, in 1999, 
the conduct of the war in Chechnya, which was put under the FSB, the Federal you know, um, Intelligence uh, Services, the successor to the KGB, when Putin was in charge of that entity and the complete flattening of Grozny and Chechnya, and then the perverse version of Chechnya that has emerged out of there, which should give us all shudders about what he thinks is going to happen in Ukraine. Uh, intervention in Syria, and we've all talked about, you know, kind of Russia participating in the leveling of Syria on behalf of propping up Assad. And, you know, I could go on, you know, Wagner Group, the paramilitary forces firing on our special forces in Syria in 2018. The whole point of all of this is to say there is a pattern here of ruthlessness of a completely brazen disregard for um, life. And then there's also a very long pattern of his view the Ukraine absolutely belongs with Russia. And if he can't control Ukraine, then he intends to punish Ukraine. And then the much broader views of NATO, European security in the United States. So there's a long pattern there. What may have changed is the hardening uh, of this viewpoint and the more emotional aspect of it. And the fact that he's stewed in his own juices of thinking about all of this for the last two years. You know, now let me let me ask you another follow up question and then I want to go to Carl. Um, you know, the question has arisen is because of his fixation on Ukraine, that it doesn't end there, uh, that then he's focused on uh, Estonia, Latvia, especially given the sizable Russian population there. Uh, the question of where does Kaliningrad fit in here? Uh, and then no less the threatening statements he has made about nuclear weapons. Could you say a word about that? And then I'd like to go to uh, Carl Bildt to get him in the conversation. Well, he's already taken over Belarus, lest we forget, completely. You know, lock, stock and barrel and using Belarus as a staging ground. So there's that. And so that really puts a lot of pressure on the Savalki Gap, uh, the stretch of land between, you know, um, Belarus and um, uh, Kaliningrad and then of course as you saying and suggesting all of the pressure that uh, will be on uh, by Putin to make sure that Kaliningrad doesn't get cut off as an exclave of Russia you know from uh, the motherland and pressure no doubt on uh, Lithuania and Poland and the rest of the Baltic states that's without a doubt but again Poland becomes part of that pressure as well because Poland now becomes the front line also Romania we saw that bizarre um, TV um, presentation by um, Alexander Lukashenko, in which he put up a map of a dismembered Ukraine and made it very clear that Moldova uh, was uh, very much in the sights there as well. So we should be deeply concerned about Moldova and uh, Transnistria, because Transnistria still has a major garrison of uh, Russian forces dating back to obviously the Soviet period. So a lot of uh, concerns there. Kazakhstan. Um, we saw um, recently the intervention of uh, the Collective Security Treaty Organization into Kazakhstan. Uh, and now these bizarre statements coming out of Zuganov. Uh, you can be sure that this is kind of coming out of that nationalist reactionary firmament inside of Moscow as well, putting the Kazakhs on notice that no one in the immediate region is going to be unaffected by all of this as well. So let's just uh, say that there's a very broad remit here. And this is where nuclear weapons come in. So let's just say Putin has already effectively used them by putting that option on the table, by doing what he intended to do was to scare everyone. He actually put us on notice uh, much earlier on in his displays of the new novel nuclear weapons, hypersonic missiles in one of his annual addresses where he simulated a missile attack in the middle of his address that looked like it was targeting Florida, uh, if people might ref reflect back to that a, a couple of years ago. Uh, in the time that I was in government, he repeatedly reminded um, the past administration and President Trump that uh, Russia had got hypersonic missiles and these novel nuclear weapons first. Yes, we would get them eventually, but we wouldn't get them soon enough to um, basically be able to, you know, rhetorically and, uh, you know, otherwise politically deploy them as he is able to right now. Of course, he's talking not just about the novel nuclear weapons, which stand behind that. We know that they have nuclear capable Iskanders in Kaliningrad. You know, we've already seen, at least we think we have, the use of um, an Iskander to fire, you know, a, a conventional missile, uh, a, a conventional um, firing into Ukraine from what it looks like uh, either Kaliningrad or perhaps Belarus, you know, the, in, the, in the heat of this battle. And I'm sure Carl can, you know, talk about this because, of course, you know, from the vantage point of Sweden, Finland and everywhere else, it looks, you know, particularly alarming. 
And it's the political pressure that he's using about nuclear weapons, the, the talk about a tactical nuke, trying to figure out how they might use this in some way. There's been a lot of loose talk in, in Moscow. Again, Putin is not someone who has the checks and balances around him of the Soviet period. He is the operative. If he has, again, Polonium and Novichok should tell us that, that if he has some cruel and unusual weapon, he would like to be able to deploy it in some way. And again, he already has politically because he wants to divert away from the war in Ukraine to get us all to be negotiating now about all of this uh, between nuclear powers and clearly, you know, to help him uh, press his case in Ukraine and in a more broader fashion. All right. Thank you. Thank you for that. And by the way, I, I saw that Ika Salonin and uh, had uh, raised the question of Finland and does Finland fit in here. And you did address that. Let me go to Carl Bilt right now. Um, Carl, I want to take you in a little bit of a different direction. And the direction is, do you see any circumstances under which a no fly zone would be declared by NATO? I feel that we have to address this issue because it comes up and it comes up and up. And I'm very struck by the fact that the former NATO Supreme Allied Commander, General Breedlove, recently wrote an op-ed actually saying uh, uh, that uh, sanctions are not going to move Putin. And he said, we have to bolster Ukraine's air defenses. And he actually does support the concept of a no-fly zone. General Wesley Clark, same thing, has come in and said, there are ways of doing this. So my question is not whether we should do it, but are there circumstances under which a no-fly zone, in fact, can be declared by NATO? And you're muted. Sorry, please uh, unmute yourself. Yes, now it's near me. Um, thanks for the question. Let me just start by saying that what we are now facing in Europe is the worst outbreak of war since September of 1939. We are 11 days into this particular war. It has already transformed the politics, foreign and security policies of most of Europe. We are only the beginning of these changes. And that's another way of saying that it's very difficult to predict what's going to happen. What we've seen so far is far stronger sanctions uh, of different sorts than I think anyone anticipated, say, uh, two weeks ago. And uh, that is a reflection of the fact that the popular political reaction of what they see happening or that television screen is so strong that all governments will be under pressure to do substantially more, both in terms of sanctions and measures against Russia, um, in order to see if uh, one can at some point in time uh, have that causing some change of Russian policies. I'm not particularly optimistic in the short term in that particular respect. And then, as you alluded to, different support measures for, um, uh, for Ukraine. And what is under consideration there at the moment is oil embargo. Um, Megan can speak about oil prices. They were evidently $140 a barrel yesterday. That's quite a lot. There is discussion about transfer of fighter aircraft from the Polish Air Force primarily to the Ukrainian Air Force. And that seems to be moving in that area, financed by the budget of the European Commission and supported by the US. It's quite an extraordinary step that no one could have thought about two weeks ago. And then discussion about a no-fly zone. A no-fly zone could be a possibility stretching over parts of Western, um, Western Ukraine. There are lots of uh, problems associated with it, but you can see momentum is building up for that. Um, but momentum is building both for stronger and stronger measures against the, uh, Russia. The Russian economy is going to take a horrible hit. Um, I saw Dary Pascal, who's not necessarily the guardian of truth and, 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 and good in the world. I mean, a leading Russian oligarch close to the regime saying the Russian economy will dive down three times as much as it did in the financial crisis in 1998 and it's going to last for three years. That's a fairly horrible scenario. There's also, as you can see, an exodus of business from Russia. Virtually, I mean, making business with Russia now in Europe is toxic. Um, so you will see more coming. Could be a no-fly zone, limited in that particular case. But you see substantial shipments of uh, anti-tank and other weapons. The only problem with that at the moment is logistic difficulties because the roads are clogged with refugees. We had 1.3 million refugees, I think. We had 40,000 coming yesterday 1.3 million total we are heading for four or five million on two or three roads so on those roads you have sort of millions of people fleeing in the one direction and substantial amount of weapons coming in the other one we're, we're heading for a drawn out war drawn out big war 
in uh, in the east of Europe, and where it will head is anyone's guess. Uh, I think Fiona can speak to that. Putin will escalate until he is forced to capitulate. But when that will happen is anyone's guess. And what we will experience in the meantime is unfortunately anyone's guess as well. Carl, let me ask you a follow-up question and then also mention to all of you, I'm gonna do another round with Fiona and Carl. I don't see that Dimitri has joined us yet. And then I'll go to questions to all of you. But let me, Carl, one more follow-up for you. You mentioned that the sanctions are working. There's been a very, very strong push, in fact, to move forward with sanctions uh, in the energy space, uh, cutting off uh, oil and gas uh, uh, exports from Russia. Please describe your perspective on that. Uh, that's been a big issue, of course, here in the United States. And uh, Secretary Blinken just indicated that it appears that the administration is going to move forward on that. Um, and then also, do you expect uh, Sweden and Finland to join NATO? Where, where does that issue stand? Well, what will happen on the sanctions side, I said, so sort of difficult to predict. I mean, oil sanctions, I mean, the, uh, there are some difficulties exactly what you can do, but I mean, you could, you could apply the kind of technique that the US used against Iran in order to block Iranian oil exports. It's not going to be perfect, but that's, perf that's perfectly doable. And, and that can be done by the United States. Gas is, of course, substantially more difficult. We have 40% of the supply of natural gas to uh, Europe um, coming from Russia. Poland has 70% of its supplies from Russia. Germany is significant. Uh, Italy is significant. So if that is stopped by, the, it could also be stopped by the Russians, by the way, as a counter sanctions. It's, we're going to take a substantial economic hit. It's going to be easier when spring comes and the heating season season uh, ceases, uh, but next winter might be um, might be difficult. But what you see, and there was a remarkable speech by the German Chancellor at the special session of the Bundestag on Sunday, there will be a deliberate attempt to get rid of all dependence on Russian gas. But that's not going to be done tomorrow. Uh, that's a year long thing, and that is part of the substantial decoupling. Uh, from all aspects of Russia that is uh, now ongoing in Europe. On Sweden and Finland, NATO, too early to say that as well, we're only 11 or 12 days into this particular war. We've seen it fundamentally transform the security policies of Germany, going well above 2% in defense spending, cutting links, doing all sorts of things that were unthinkable. We saw the Danes doing a complete U-turn in security policy uh, yesterday. Uh, the Finnish president was here in Washington on Friday. I happen to be in DC at the moment. And there is substantial coordination with Sweden, seeking a much closer relationship with NATO. It's difficult to see how we can get closer without being members. So you will see movement in that particular space as well. It's not going to happen tomorrow, but a couple of weeks down the road, uh, you will see something happening. All right, thank you, Carl. As I said, let me, I'd like to do one more round with Fiona and Carl, and hopefully we'll see Dimitri, and then I will come to the questions. I see a number of hands up here. Um, uh, Fiona, uh, the question about these Russian uh, Ukrainian negotiations are these completely fruitless? Uh, how do you see them? Uh, there is another round that's going on today. And are there any viable diplomatic solutions that you see here in this uh, situation? Well, I think the main point is what Carl just said, that Putin is not in the, mean, uh, in the mood to negotiate, he, uh, unless it's the capitulation and total surrender of Ukraine and you know, some um, means by which he consolidates his hold over Ukraine and the, all the things that he's demanded already in the documents that were submitted to us in December of last year and all of the other issues that have been put on the table ever since. So right now, um, as, as I think President Macron quite rightly uh, surmised from his encounter with Putin, uh, Putin thinks that things are on track. I mean, it's hard from our perspective to see how they could be, of course. But again, this is and this is why, of course, many people are thinking, well, the man's deluded. But from his own rational worldview, and this is, again, his rationale, his worldview, the perspective that he looks at things from, the complete and utter destruction of Ukraine is an end game. 
and he's not finished with that yet. Again, I have said, and many other people have said many times, Putin doesn't have the same view about mass casualties that we do, including of their own troops. Now, there may become a different matter later when the bodies on the battlefield are counted, but not right now. I mean, we're hearing these horrific stories of, you know, Russian uh, casualties just being left behind. I think that's part of the whole thing uh, so that Putin can basically press this as far as is necessary until he thinks it's finished. So that makes this set of negotiations beyond trying to get humanitarian uh, corridors rather fruitless. But it does not mean that dip diplomacy is pointless. And I think what we have to do right now is try to focus on how we can create a diplomatic frame that brings in countries and individuals uh, as well who have some kind of, I wouldn't say leverage, but sway with Putin. So it's very important to do this in the United Nations. I would say that we have to keep concentrating on China and President Xi and trying to figure out again how we could change their calculus in terms of China as to whether this is in their interests or not. I think President Xi could have some um, effect on, tr on Putin in terms of trying to at least stop the hostilities. But again, you know, it's a question of what Putin wants to get out of this uh, or wants to have out of this that he can uh, spin uh, to victory and to in be in keeping with what he's telling on the home front uh, is this um, special military operation. We've got to bear in mind that Putin is supposed to be putting himself up for re-election in 2024. So the complete collapse of the Russian economy, uh, the bogging down of the military conflict is not going to be a good thing. So somewhere along the line, he'll want to spin this into something else, but that's not now. Uh, thinking about, you know, other, we've just seen uh, Naftali Bennett, which I'm very relieved, you know, to see that they, he went out on a, on a um, because Israel does have some standing uh, with Putin and the Israeli leadership. So we've got to start thinking of things like this. UAE has got the chairmanship of the United Nations Security Council. The UK comes in next. UAE has good relations with um, all parties here. So we have to have creative thinking about our diplomacy here, about who are individuals and what are countries that might be able to, India comes in mind as well. And if Modi wasn't just focusing on trying to get all of the Indian students out of Kharkiv and Kiev, you know, perhaps Modi could also uh, basically have a discussion with um, uh, Putin. But we have to get the message out to um, all of our other interlocutors in the UN Assembly, General Assembly, uh, overall that this is a dreadful precedent for everyone, including for China as well. So the more that we can articulate the way that this is reshaping the global landscape in ways that are not propitious for any other country, the more chance we have of being able to craft a diplomatic response that at least we can try to stop the hostilities and then move on from there to try to figure out how we create some room for Vladimir Putin to be able to spin this, that he's got what he wants out of it, which is going to be very unpalatable for all of us, but it may be the only way right now. If we talk about regime change, we talk about fallout war with Russia, he's going to not just keep doubling down, but tripling down. And just as Carl has said, keep on escalating. Okay. All right. Thank you, Carl. Uh, let me ask you one last question, and then we're going to go to Jane Harmon and Joe Nye. We'll probably take two questions together, but hold, uh, please, for one minute. Let me ask my last question that I want of you. You mentioned Germany, and I think it's important for you to say a bit more about Germany and specifically about this change of policy. Uh, what are the implications of this? It was rather significant with the chancellor coming forward. You referenced it. I'd like to hear from you a little bit more on, on that about the implications of the German change and what does it mean in right now in, in terms of uh, the uh, war in Ukraine. And then also China. Uh, uh, I want you to address the Chinese have put on the table an offer to mediate. Is that something that we should be looking at seriously? You heard what Fiona had to say. On the mediation, the others that have done it, I think the one who's most active is, um, or two are active. I mean, President Erdogan from Turkey has been trying to put himself as a mediator forward. Uh, President Macron of France has, I think, has had four or five talks with President Putin, he had an hour and a half yesterday again. And the basic conclusion coming out of Macron or the, his entourage after those is things are going to get worse. I mean, there are no sign whatsoever of flexibility of Mr. Putin. And accordingly, the only option that we have at the moment um, is to increase pressure on him militarily by supplies to Ukraine, economically by the sanctions issues, um, 
dramatically, as Fiona indicated. Uh, there was a devastating vote for him against him in the UN General Assembly. There was another in the UN Human Rights Council. They're utterly isolated all over the world. Uh, we must increase pressure on all fronts until there might be some possibility of getting um, some sort of negotiation going in, in Germany. But it's not only Germany, it's happening all over Europe. Of course, there's been uh, wake up or call it whatever, but I mean, a fundamental reappraisal of the nature of the regime in Russia. I find it difficult that there will ever be the possibility of going back to anything resembling normal relationship with uh, Russia under, under Vladimir Putin. I mean, this is really too big. Um, uh, both in terms of the sort of human costs and the refugees and uh, Europe, we had the Balkan Wars. Um, they were, by comparison, minor, uh, minor affairs in a part of Europe that is had been problematic before. This is a major European war with significant ramifications all across the board. So there will be no way of going back to normal. Um, and that's, of course, the dilemma here. I mean, President Putin has himself put himself in a horrible corner, uh, which is very difficult to see that he can get out of without very significant um, turmoil change. So we are 11 days. We are heading for something that is far worse than we've seen so far, sorry to say. All right, uh, thank you both Fiona and Carl. Let's go to uh, Jane Harmon. Uh, why don't we get your uh, question, Carmen, and please, uh, no speeches on anyone, from anyone. <laughs> okay, mm -hmm. well, good morning, everyone. This is absolutely the best ever panel I've seen on Ukraine. Congratulations to the Trilateral Commission, Paula and dear friends on this panel. Um, I, I have no speeches, but one, uh, why can't we get the truth to the Russian people? I know they've cracked down on tech companies operating in Russia, but we're the world is very smart here. And I can't imagine that a worldwide tech army with photographs of dead Russians, et cetera, et cetera, can't get more going on in Russia, which would lead to a major backlash against Putin. There already is some. That's number one. Number two, very fast, Paula, is that I read over the weekend that uh, uh, Russia now wants to tank the uh, the deal with the JCPOA, which has been somewhat renegotiated. Mm -hmm. And the reason they do is they don't want Iranian oil on the world market because that will, again, uh, reduce the hardship on everyone else about to engage in, a, in an oil and gas embargo with Russia. Okay, uh, thank you for those uh, questions, uh, Fiona and uh, Carl, over to you both. Fiona, do you wanna uh, begin? Sure, that? well, I, I mean, I think, you know, Jen, um, uh, that's right. Um, I'm, I'm sure that there's a lot of calculation going on uh, with Russia uh, right now about um, the possibilities of Iran, Venezuela. I mean, we've also heard that there's been um, visits to Venezuela uh, to talk about the same things. I mean, obviously, bringing Venezuela and Iranian capacity online would help to ease some of the uh, shortages, especially if the Saudis and OPEC Plus are not um, stepping up because they're all thinking about a massive windfall um, at, the, at this particular moment, which will give them more leverage as well. But as Carl says, as things move on, you know, views may change. I think the other reason that the Russians want to um, stymie JCPOA, even though uh, they were very much in favor of it before is because of this kind of nuclear atmosphere that they're trying to create at the moment of scaring the world with the prospect of nuclear proliferation and you know kind of basically probably keeping every, every neighborhood on edge and you know they're, they're basically positing that the ukrainians were heading down the same path as iran or uh, north korea in terms of trying to acquire nuclear capacity so i'm just kind of waiting for the accusations now that they've got nuclear power plants in their possession at zaporizhia and obviously the chernobyl zone you know claims that fantastical and false claims that ukraine was somehow exploring you know the creation of some kind of tactical battlefield nukes or something like this so just you know putting all that out there if they do say that that's the kind of you know play that we're in the midst of right now they're just pushing all kinds of disinformation out there which gets to your first point as well we're now in an environment in which Russia is trying to highly restrict actual information and trying to proliferate its own disinformation. I mean, I'm not at all surprised, honestly, that Dmitry's not with us. In fact, I would have been surprised if he was, given what's going on in Moscow right now. Uh, I think there's an awful lot of people who are out there looking at exactly what you're talking about and different ways and pathways of getting information in. 
And I think it's also pretty vital to keep up this diplomacy of all of the leaders, Erdogan, you know, Macron, you know, you name it, going and talking to Putin, because there is a question about what he himself is getting in terms of information uh, and, and the world, you know, in which he operates. Remember years back, Angela Merkel uh, told um, uh, her, you know, Obama it was then, you know, and her other international counterparts that Putin is in his own world. She didn't mean that he was deranged, but that he operates in his own universe of information as well. And we have to figure out how to keep penetrating that. But I think that, you know, your first point is absolutely vital and, and people are thinking about this in various different ways. And a lot of it is, you know, people to people. I think the one thing uh, also that Putin never factored in is this, the how horizontally networked the rest of the world, including Ukraine, is outside of Russia. And how many there were millions of Ukrainians and Ukrainian Americans like Paula and, you know, others that we know of who were already out there before these millions of refugees. And there, I'm sure that there will be the equivalent of a digital Manhattan type project emerging of all of these tech workers and software developers of Ukraine finding ways of fighting this in different ways. Thank you, Carl. Do you have something you'd like to add before I go to Joe Nye? Well, yes, yes, very briefly to remind of the, the, the fundamental fact that television is the medium that really applies in terms of the politics of Russia. Uh, we have a young generation uh, in Moscow, St. Petersburg and elsewhere that are connected to the net and YouTube and whatever, but the vast bulk of people look at television and that is pure propaganda and horrible. That means that at the moment, I think Putin has, if not majority support, a majority tolerance of what he's doing because they don't have access to any other information. On can anything be done over the internet? Yeah, things are being done. You can see, um, you can see things happening by different hacker groups that are quite significant, both Belarus and Ukrainian hacker groups and others. But there are some very extremely disturbing signs at the moment that the Russians are preparing to cut themselves off from the internet uh, on March the 11th um, in order to cut down primarily YouTube. That's the only way they can get rid of YouTube is to cut completely. Um, they can do that. And uh, my fear is that if they cut from internet, they will start to cut us in different ways from the internet as well. I mean, this might be an all out war before we wake up for the next trilateral commission meeting. If I may, I'd like to go to both Joe Nye and Antonio Ortiz Menya. If you don't mind, let's take both of your questions and then get their responses, because I'd like to get in as many questions as we can. We have 20 minutes. Joe Nye. Thanks, Paula. Uh, I want to follow up on Fiona's point about nuclear weapons. Uh, we know, as Fiona told Politico, that yes, of course, he would think about it. But we then have to be a little bit more refined in what does that mean? If one goes back to the 1960s and Herman Kahn's ladder of escalation, there are steps below and above the actual explosion of a weapon. He's already taken the steps below, declaratory threats, nuclear alerts. The question I have is, will he cross that threshold of explosion? And if so, how far will he go? Uh, after you cross the threshold, you could imagine a demonstration shot let's say over the Black Sea, you can imagine a tactical weapon used against uh, Ukrainian units, let's say in, uh, in the East uh, um, uh, Ukraine. Uh, you, can use, you can imagine a major use against Ukrainian military units to try to tip the, the uh, battle uh, and so on up the ladder. The question is, once you start that, uh, it, it, it is, Putin homicidal, of course. Is he suicidal? We don't know. So my question is, has he gotten himself or could he get himself into a image of something like Samson in the temple where he'd rather pull down the temple than see him lose um, what he has said is his objective. So I, I wanna press harder on this comment of would Putin think of nuclear weapons? Yes, he has, but how far up a Herman Kahn escalation ladder can you imagine him going? Joe, I'm glad you did. Hold that thought, Fiona. Uh, Antonio Ortiz Menya, may we have your question? Yes, thank you. I have a question about sanctions and different scenarios for sanctions. Uh, 
because at the outset, uh, I think Secretary Rice was quoted as saying, you know, Putin has become unpredictable. So what is exactly the aim behind sanctions? I know that the Chinese, uh, sorry, the Russian economy is reeling, but is it to have Putin at the table, withdraw, whatever? There is a reticence outside Western Europe to impose stronger sanctions. So what is really sort of thinking down the line, different scenarios behind sanctions? All right, thank you, Fiona. If you'll take the first, Carl, if you'll take the sanctions question, Fiona. Yeah, and actually just quickly on the sanctions, uh, just for, for Carl um, as well, because I was talking to colleagues over the weekend um, that said that you know the sanctions on the European part have gone far faster than anyone anticipated, almost to the point that almost the whole arsenal of sanctions has kind of been on the table and then some. So I would like, you know, maybe Carl to, you know, elaborate on that bit as well, because it, we, you know, we went much further than anyone thought that we ever would. Uh, and then there's the difficulty of bringing that back. And I think that that fits into, um, in fact, uh, the question that or, or the way that Joe framed this, right? Because when we talk about all our economic war with Russia, Russia can't fight that economic war in the same way that we can. And so that's when I start to also worry about, as you mentioned, the Herman Kahn ladder, that Putin starts to think about escalating for de-escalation, not just in the battlefield sense uh, of the military, you know, kinetic war, but also in that economic sense about, you know, um, I remember, you know, Graham Allison used to say, you know, one nuclear missile will ruin everyone's day, right? I mean, it wasn't just, um, you know, kind of uh, the, the use of it, but the effect of, of the use. And I do worry, I'll, I'll be honest, that I do worry about him going one more step up that ladder for um, <clears throat> for demonstration effect which is absolutely why we then need the new other nuclear powers uh, and everyone else who has, you know, kind of aspirations, you know, to be put on notice here as well. Uh, and to get, you know, we were supposed to be have the non-proliferation talks coming up, which seem to be out of the window. And clearly if Putin does make a step like that of some of the scenarios you were thinking about and, you know, General Breedlove and other, um, I, I was on a, um, a press thing with, um, former, you know, Sakya Stavridis, who was worrying about this uh, just yesterday, for example, uh, that, you know, how do you stop Putin from trying to do that demonstration effect because of what that would then imply in, you know, the whole world of proliferation as well that, you know, for we've been looking for Kim Jong-un and, you know, Iran for some time, Kim Jong-un already having got that capability and how can he blackmail and hold hostage neighbors and as the United States for kind of leverage. And Putin would of course be absolutely and utterly cementing that idea that the only way that you really do have leverage in any kind of dispute is to have a nuclear weapon and be prepared, you know, to use it for demonstration, you know, effect as well. In one of these sort of controlled, you know, usage that you're talking about, I've, I've heard, you know, many military people going through the same thing, although all saying at the same time, just what you said, very high threshold, hard to kind of, you know, conceive of this being able to be done in a contained fashion, uh, hoping, you know, that obviously people around Putin who are military experts and who, you know, work in this field are creating some kind of constraints. But again, Putin is the operative, always wanting to be able to use, you know, something in some way, which uh, in itself is, is dangerous. So unfortunately, I do think that he might try to, if the situation gets so bad, go that next step up the ladder so we need to get the p5 in the united uh, nations uh, security council including china thinking about this and we also need to then be pushing out the fact that this would be absolutely and utterly impermissible but i, I fear again this escalatory uh, level on uh, the economic front as well because there's no going back as carl's already said in the russian economy now all right thank you carl well, the, the aim of sanctions policy, as has been decided by the political authorities, is clearly to try to force a change in uh, Russian behavior. Uh, is that possible to achieve short term? I don't think it is. Is it possible to achieve medium term? Possibly. But there's another aspect which is becoming even more important. That is what we call the voluntary sanctions. And that is companies leaving Russia because avoiding reputational damage. Uh, the most significant, we've, se we've seen a couple of very significant and even surprising steps, uh, to mention a couple of them. On the oil sector, BP, that has a nearly 20% stake in Rosneft, and Rosneft is, I think, 
the number one or number two in the world or something like that. They are immediately selling that entire stake at the loss of billions and billions because no one is going to buy it. Uh, Shell has left Russia completely. Exxon has left. Even any of Italy is leading is Russia business. The only one remaining so far is Total of France. Uh, the one that can hit even more, I think, is IKEA. Um, IKEA was the first really to move into Russia in the early 90s, and it was highly symbolic and significant. I mean, West, the sort of furniture and whatever for ordinary Russians, they have paused everything, closing down everything, stopping all imports, stopping all exports. They use the word pause and laying off 15,000 people all across Russia. And they do this, this because of reputational issues. I mean, they, 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 they would have such a strong reaction against the companies in their normal operations if they don't leave Russia at this particular time. So that we see, uh, and that is perhaps even more significant now than the official sanctions. That is, boardrooms are taking decisions to leave Russia because otherwise they will ever have other problems with, with their customers. Okay, thank you for that. Let's go to the next two. Uh, forgive my pronunciation, Takehiko Nakao. Uh, we'd like to hear from you and Halima Croft. Let's hear both of your questions. Thank you very much. Uh, I visited uh, Georgia and other uh, former republics of uh, Russia as a uh, uh, Soviet as uh, president of ADB, and I had a uh, feeling uh, about the sentiment of those people against uh, Russia and the uh, complications. But my question is, uh, I mean, I think it is, uh, uh, I don't know whether this is appropriate question or not, and it's too late to ask this question, but as uh, Jeffrey Sachs wrote in the Financial Times, wasn't uh, this a uh, war avoidable uh, by having some uh, kind of uh, the accommodative is uh, not a good word, but uh, to understand his paranoia at this moment, at least uh, to avoid the war because uh, this outright war is a damage to the existing order and can have uh, escalation uh, risk and so on. So uh, okay. uh, even the principle should be, uh, should be, uh, should be uh, kept, but I think uh, this uh, war should have been avoided anyway. That is my question. Thank, thank, thank you for that. And you also wrote your comment in the chat and thank you and the others who've done that. Halima, what's your question? Because we have uh, a little bit over 10 minutes. Okay, I'll be super quick. First of all, I just like to say that, you know, even if we get Iran and Venezuela back, it's going to take time and cannot plug a hole that we're seeing through the self sanctioning that Carl mentioned. I mean, we think now we've potentially lost two to 3 million barrels of Russian exports simply by companies walking away. It's not just BP, it's trading houses, banks will not finance this trade, ships will not carry this crude. And so I think that we could potentially see soon 70% of Russian exports off the market before we even start talking about second secondary sanctions. But my question is, Carl, you mentioned that we could potentially see Russia withholding gas supplies into Europe as sort of a countermeasure. We've had you know, German officials out this morning again saying they're not going to sanction Russian energy. I mean, what should we be looking at in the economic realm for Russian countermeasures? Because these, these sanctions are so tough. What do we think Russia could do in response to raise the pain economically in the West, besides oil prices? All right, let's this time, Carl, why don't we begin with you and then Fiona, and if you both could give pithy answers so we could catch the last two questions and then I have a final one. Carl. Options for Russia are limited. The only really significant that I can see is cutting Nord Stream 1. That's 55 DCM. Um, they could do that. Um, they would then lose a hell of a lot of money. Uh, they have reserves. Now some of these reserves have been frozen. I don't think anyone knows the numbers really. Uh, I don't see anything else really that sort of the Russia can do in terms of counter sanctions that is really significant. All right, uh, Fiona, the question about could this have been avoided? If you'll give a brief answer to that. Well, we would have had to really be um, cognizant of this, I would say back in 1999. So, um, which we should have been um, about um, basically trying to kind of figure out um, how to mitigate the likely responses of Russia to um, NATO. So 1999, I pick because this was the period when Putin was at the head of the um, security services and it was the bombing of Belgrade. And this was a kind of a shift uh, on the part of all Russians who observe this, of thinking of NATO as a military alliance that could be targeted against them. So we were put on notice in 1999 that all Russians actually then had changed their view of what NATO was. Putin wasn't just then uh, the president, but we should have then been trying to think about how we would handle 
uh, the the further um, uh, well, the, the, that was the beginning of the expansion of NATO in the context of um, dealing with Russia itself. But it's not just that to bear in mind. It is the fact that Russia and, and people like Putin would have always been opposed of Ukraine going any in any other different direction away from Russia. This is not just about NATO. It's the fact that Ukraine over time was becoming more like a Finland, a Sweden, you know, and other um, you know parts of you know the, the of Europe that weren't NATO members but would look increasingly like it was moving in a different direction. That also may have you know triggered a very strong reaction at some point. But we've had a very long run up to where we are now. And there certainly was his speech that he gave at the Munich Security Conference in 2007, which clearly laid out his intent and goals. Giampaolo de Paolo, uh, let's hear from you. And yeah, I, oh, oh, yeah, Carl I think Gold Carl keeps... wanted to say something on this point. Yeah. Go ahead, Carl. Go ahead. Sorry. Uh, I, 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 let, let, let in some questions first, and then I can, when we sum up, sum up say something. Okay. All right. Thank you. Uh, and then I have one last one for both of you. Giampaolo Di Paola, let's hear from you and Alexandra de Hoop Schaeffer. Uh, let's get both of your comments and questions. Thank you very quick. What I, I heard the brother of pushing for a humanitarian fly zone. What, and I heard Carl saying and a Western limit, Western Ukraine limited no fly zone. What is the benefit of it? What is the pro and con calculus on this? And the second is, the P5 declaration beginning with the year that no, uh, a nuclear war cannot be fight, fought, cannot be won. Does that have any meaning? Thank you. Okay, Alexandra. Yes, thank you very much. Um, my first question is actually the, the same. What could a limited no-fly zone look like? It seems that uh, no one in NATO, Secretary General has been very clear that uh, you know, they don't, they don't want to have a no-fly zone, but um, what Calbit proposed seems interesting, so I'd like to see what it could look like. The second question is the United States working actively with uh, Poland uh, to send fighter jets to Ukraine. Isn't that an indirect or direct way of engaging NATO in the conflict? Thank you very much. Paula, you're on mute. Oh, Paula, yeah. Paula, you, yeah. Sorry, mute. sorry, I'm on mute. Sorry. Okay. Um, um, let's go to you, Fiona, and then Carl, and please respond to these. And I'd like to just inject a question to both of you. What's the end game here? What's the outcome? What do you see? Fiona, if you go first. Uh, Yes, yeah, and actually, I mean, I, I was just looking um, on um, line right now because there do seems to have been a few, you know, kind of developments, you know, here and there that might be relevant to the question that you've just said, Paula. Um, okay, I mean, Alexandra is absolutely right. I mean, this would be an, uh, an indirect but ultimately direct way, right, of getting, you know, NATO involvement. So we're going to have to tread extremely carefully. And I think, you know, I'll leave the other discussions of the humanitarian no flies on to Carl, who's been articulating this, I think, you know, in an extremely, you know, kind of cogent an important way here because it is vital that we do something and you know obviously as Carl has already said with the limited roads clogged with millions of refugees right now flooding into Poland and Romania and uh, Hungary and every adjacent country you know we really need to um, be able to to do something and that fits into really the, the the end game or the beginning of some kind of end game which is really to try to stop the hostilities and to try to you know figure out from there where we go um, I was just uh, seeing that there's has been a proposal put forward by you know the Russians, um, which um, you know look like um, so the Kremlin's announcing demands for ending the war, but maybe this might be just to have a, a pause in the war. Ukraine to change the constitution to guarantee it won't join any blocs, i.e. NATO and possibly the EU as well, because although you know the Russians have recently said the EU isn't a problem, absolutely it is, and I'm sure that this appeal. Uh, for Ukraine and Georgia and Moldova now, all asking for immediate EU. It's what I said before, which is that um, Putin doesn't want anywhere in his vicinity, anywhere in the old Russian Imperium, going anywhere into a different network, a different franchise, and out of his, uh, you know, basically his control in some way. So the EU is just as um, vital here. Uh, Ukraine recognizing Crimea as part of Russia and then recognizing the eastern separatist regions as independent. So all of the things that have already been on the table as far as Putin is concerned. So this is obviously his minimal. Um, stick the floor that he's kind of setting here from where he takes it from there so the end game paula looks like basically agreeing to negotiate on this basis trying to kind of halt hostilities as much as we can 
uh, and then kind of basically taking it from there in terms of discussions. But it's clear that and if Putin feels that things are not going in his direction, that he's always going to be escalating again and moving out from there. Because Putin, as the student of history he is self-taught, has often complained that in the past, when Russia's won a war, like the Russo-Turkish war, the Europeans always have a treaty, I think like the Treaty of Berlin at the time, that takes away everything that Russia has gained. So what Putin um, wanted is what he laid out already, which is pretty much everything that's been on the table. This is the, this is the minimum floor, not the maximalist ceiling that he's put out there that seems to be the new opening gambit. And it's making it very clear that he wants something out of this, something that he can take home. And then he will also want to have some kind of reversal of all of this economic pain that has been inflicted uh, on Russia. And that, I think, is going to be highly unlikely at this particular juncture or for the foreseeable future. All right. Thank you for that, Carl. Over to you and take a few minutes. We might spill over by a few minutes, but please, uh, there are a number of issues on the table here for you to address. Just make the remark on the NATO question, because that's been very much in focus, that go back in time, NATO was not a popular thing in Ukraine. And that goes back to what Fiona mentioned, the, the, the bombing of Belgrade in 1999. I mean, that turned public opinion very much also in Ukraine against NATO. I remember seeing Zelensky before the, before the, just during the election campaign, before he was elected, and I said, you know, you don't talk about NATO. At all. It's not part of your platform. Now we said it's not a very popular thing. It might be good with NATO, but it's not, it's not really our priority. What has been happening is, of course, that Putin has turned Ukrainian public opinion into the most ardent supporters of NATO that you can find on the continent of Europe. Um, and Ukraine has that sort of, it, it is a democracy, uh, which is sort of problematic from that point of view, in that it's dependent upon public opinion. So NATO has gone from virtually non-issue, although for Yushchenko he was, but anyhow, into one of the things that they really would like to see in order they see it as the savior of their nation. And um, that makes it somewhat difficult to handle. And, and, and that is uh, another reflection of the profoundly counterproductive policies that Putin has been conducting against Ukraine. I, I, I normally say that his, his track record of misjudging Ukraine over the past 20 years is absolutely impeccable. Everything he's done has turned the nation of Ukraine, a democracy, against Russia in a way that was unthinkable a couple of decades ago. I mean, these are, these are different nations, no question about that. But these were nations with basically fairly friendly relations. I mean, they're closely related to each other in history, but they, they, Ukraine has a national identity. Uh, and and Many Russians have difficulty accepting that, but they see Ukrainian national identity. Now it is an enormous Ukrainian national identity. And he has produced a nation, Putin has produced a nation that hates Russia. Uh, that's the reality of it. That's going to make it somewhat more difficult when it comes to political negotiations, because a political deal has to be a political deal between Moscow and Kiev, and between a democratically elected leadership of Kiev. Um, a number of the demands that Russia is putting forward um, can only be imposed by force upon Ukraine. And uh, that is a fundamental dilemma. And that makes me also somewhat pessimistic about any easy or early outcome of this particular conflict. Uh, he has created a nation that hates Russia in the immediate vicinity of Russia. And that's not going to go away for quite some time, sorry to say. Carl and Fiona, outstanding panel. You've covered really the ground. There was quite extensive. I, I'm sorry that our colleague, Dmitry Trenin, uh, couldn't uh, be here. Uh, as you said at the outset, Fiona, it could be because uh, clearly his own situation and circumstances, mm -hmm. uh, clearly. Uh, I wanna congratulate you both. I also wanna congratulate all of our colleagues, outstanding questions. And thank you for those who also put comments and questions in the chat. And Megan, uh, thank you and your team. Uh, this was extremely timely and very informative. And thank you. All of you, we ran on time. It's nine o'clock, 0901, but we made it. And uh, to be continued, we'll look forward to part two of this. Thank you and great to see all of you. <laughs>